Hey, good. So the floor is mine. The floor is yours, indeed. Well, thank you again, John Rogers and the California Rare Fruit Growers San Diego chapter for having me. My name is Charles Malke. I'm a biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And I just want to share a little bit of background about myself so you know a little bit about us and our brand and what we bring to the gardening community throughout the United States and actually in 13 marketplaces around the world. Uh, I want to first start off with also... Um, letting you know that I'm also a member of the California Rare Fruit Growers chapter here in Los Angeles. I'm also part-time participant in Orange County. And I want to invite all of you guys to also meet me at the um, Walter Anderson Nursery that I'm going to be teaching the gardening club class on Saturday, July 25th at nine o'clock in the morning. And that's the one on Enterprise Street in San Diego. There's two chapters and I'll put in the address um, later on in the comments. Out of curiosity, before I go a little deeper, um, how many people are in the classroom that are not on this Zoom meeting? If I can get a number. Okay, hold on a second. Just approximate. Like eight, 17? 17 and then we've got about 12 here. So about 30 people, just to let you know, as I go through this um, presentation, and similar to what I'm gonna be doing on Saturday morning at Walter Anderson, which again, I'll put the address towards the end. Um, I'm going to be giving away a, a lot of products and, and gifts, but I wanna share with you a special gift that I'm gonna make available to you guys, the California Rare Fruit Growers Chapter, which again, I'm a member of as well, are these Sunshine Blueberry Starter Plants, which I don't know if you guys can see this logo. It's from Four Winds Growers and we, have been working with them for many years now and we reached out to them earlier this year and we said if there was a blueberry variety you could recommend two ivory organics that we can share with our community and i've got about a handful of these left so i'm going to bring five of these to the first five california rare fruit grower members that come to me on saturday morning at nine o'clock or just shortly before i'm going to have these plants hidden away and gifted for you guys to incorporate because i don't want to confuse this since they are nursery as well but these plants will be for you. They'll be pre-packaged in boxes and you'll just put them right in your car and you'll see that it comes for four winds growers and chances are they're supplying their plants from another source. Um, and this is just a quick gardening tip and still part of my introduction is the sunshine blueberry plant is one of four winds growers favorite plants because they are self fertile varieties. They're also compact plants that grow about two to three feet. And the other one of my favorite reasons for um, incorporating blueberries in your garden, whether or not you have land or not, is these are ideally grown in container. So even if you have dirt, your blueberries will typically perform better in a container environment because you can control the fertilization, nutrition, watering, and everything else. And blueberries hate being wet and cold, which is typically your winter months. And the sunshine blueberries will be, you know, an awesome addition. Um, and productive addition to your garden. And a lot of these small plants already have tiny blueberries on them, which you should remove as soon as you incorporate into your garden and look forward to that fruit set by next year. So first five people that meet me, I'm gonna have these plants hidden and looking forward to hopefully meeting you guys in person when I'm in San Diego this weekend, Saturday morning, nine o'clock. Um, a little bit more background about myself. And I have only one last question for John, if you don't mind answering is, how much time do I have? It's seven o'clock now, if you can just let me know roughly how much time I've got, and I'll try to um, gear these topics that I want to review with the group. Um, I think we're going to cap it at about an hour, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. so let's do it, and I'm going to try to answer as many of your questions towards the end. If there's other questions, um, as I'm answering questions, I can start. I see there's something going on in the chat room, but I'm not even going to look until we get closer to the end. Um, with that being said, a little bit of background about myself. My education is in biology. Most of my coursework is in botany. I graduated from the University of California, Irvine. I spent about three years of research doing cardiothoracic surgery, research and working with cardiologists and I published in national journals of surgery. And one of the um, projects I worked on was encapsulating antibiotics with fats. And when inserted at the site of surgery, it basically releases antibiotics for several days up to several weeks. And it's these encapsulated fats as the body breaks them down, releasing continuous antibiotic and prevents the chance of 
infection and other disease at the site of operation compared to taking oral antibiotics, which where, and, you know, and making sure you're consistently taking those antibiotics every six or 12 hours, however they're recommended, but they break down quickly compared to these encapsulated antibiotics. Similarly, Ivory Organics actually encapsulated these oils, which we're going to get to in a moment when we cover a topic known as whitewashing. But I'm going to save that for later, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit of my background with biology. I then ended up from my pre-med career doing law school here in California and practicing law in Florida for up to 10 years, um, specifically in real estate, came back about 10 years ago and brought the Ivory Organics brand to life incorporating both law, the patent, the trademark, the licensing, all of that, working with attorneys across the country. And now, again, Ivory Organic brand products are in stores across the country, including Home Depot, as well as 13 marketplaces around the world, um, which, again, the bread and butter and what is the heart of our company is the whitewash products. And hopefully a lot of you guys have heard about us as we are the number one brand pretty much on social media, specifically on YouTube. We've got about 180,000 followers. We teach about 10 to 40,000 people every day on YouTube. And again, aside from our other social media platforms, which I encourage you guys to check us out on is Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Um, and I'm sure there's probably more, uh, but the goal is like, find us, connect with us, watch the lessons that we share on a weekly basis. I've also published a book um, over here about saving the world with the home garden. And this year basically summarizes about 400 lessons um, that we've published on the Ivory Organics YouTube channel, including people you may know, such as Tom Spellman, Dave Wilson Nursery, the Zager Genetic Orchard. We met with Floyd Zager, um, Epic Gardener there in San Diego, Kevin Espertu. Um, and the list continues. Dr. Gundry, another um, you know, platform that we got to teach on, can be found there at the Ivory Organics YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to, for those of you that have not yet already said, so I'm going to be giving away three of these cans. It's about a $30 value. So I want you guys to be on the edge of your seat. For those of you in the classroom, I'm going to be looking at the chat room first. You guys did put in the time to drive there. So you guys have that incurred cost. So I'm waiting for whoever's in the classroom, those first hands or two to answer. I've got three questions lined out that it's going to be part of um, the presentation. I'm going to be including the Ivory Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard. It basically offers protection against damaging summer sunburn and insects and rodents. We're going to go into more detail about that once we get to the topic of whitewashing. But again, I want you, um, you know, be, pre be prepared to answer these questions. For those of you in the chat room, you can throw in your answers there. But again, I'm giving priority to the classroom, first person, second person to answer there first. And then we'll be looking in the chat room to see who's got the first answer correct. And there'll be three winners of this Ivory Organics 3 one Plant Guard product, in addition to free shipping um, to your address, which I'll get following this meeting. Um, I also want to share with you that we have a promo code for this group. If you do shop Ivory Organic brand products, if you type in IVO Loyal for Ivory Organic Loyal 10, I'll put that again in the chat room towards the end. This will get you 10% off of the entire store and heads up for those of you that can wait until July 1st is free shipping as well, which will be going on for 10 days, the first days, um, first 10 days of July. Um, I think I covered everything. We covered the blueberry plants. Oh, and then also, if you guys want to learn more about blueberries, I interviewed also Aaron Dillon. He's the owner of the Four Winds Growers. And you can get a lot of helpful tips on how to plant these blueberry plants in your garden. Um, or if you've already got blueberries or looking to incorporate blueberries, there's an excellent lesson taught by the owner of Four Winds Growers um, that you can find published at the Ivory Organics YouTube channel about three or four weeks ago. Um, first topic, and question to the classroom first and then again open forum i'll be jumping in the chat room so i'm going to give you guys about a minute or two to answer this is what is the most important time and i'm keyword is usa for whitewashing your fruit trees so i'm looking for a season most important time usa for whitewashing fruit trees i know in san diego you have a different climate but I'm looking for the classroom. If there's someone that can share what's the most important time to whitewash your fruit trees, and then I'll explain a little bit more about this topic. So, John, is there an answer in the classroom? Oh, um, we have the summer, we have the spring. Yeah, summer and spring. spring before the heat. Is there a second answer? Fall. What was yours, Maria? Summer. Summer. Yeah, summer. Okay, so I'm looking at the chat room. I'm still looking for another answer. Winter. We got a winter. Yeah. 
So the classroom that said winter. So chat room, you had enough time to um, answer. Um, I gave you, I gave the classroom a head start, but I knew it was hard enough that the 30 of you probably would not get it. But this is now at least I know so you guys at least learned one thing so far today, all of you. The answer is winter. The number one time, and you can Google this and research the as much as you want out of this. Winter is the number one time, yet summer is the number one time, you know, spring and summer that we sell the most product. But if you research the professional commercial growers and we supply our products to them too, the number one time across the country that they whitewash their trees is late fall in time to protect their plants from the winter. Um, and specifically, when you take a look at our products in detail, it's hard, hard to see on this can and especially on the back, this, the fine print. But whitewashing is predominantly to protect your plants, one, from summer sunburn, but more importantly across the country is winter sun scald. And sun scald is an issue which affects all of us, even in San Diego, when you have these um, really cold nights, and even though I know it's more tropical down there, um, I'm here in Los Angeles, but in, here in Los Angeles, just to let you know, there's parts in our county that do have um, below freezing temperatures as you get up into higher elevations and further away from the coastline. But I'm here near Universal. We never really deal with freeze. I think our coldest nighttime lows is in the 40s. I think for you, it might be in the 50s. But the, um, the, um, basically, the winter sun scald issues is predominantly nighttime lows that are in the freezing temperatures followed by daytime temperatures that are warm. And warm could be 65. It could be 75. You have those warm days. The fluids in the trees are beginning to move up and down. Um, you know, moisture loss is happening above the ground level, but below the ground, it's still cold and freezing and, and the roots are not active at all. And what ends up happening by springtime after repeated sun scald issues throughout winter is the trees basically dry out, they desiccate, they lose, lose a lot of their energy. They might push out blooms, they might push out shoots, but within a few weeks or even a couple of months thereafter, they just dry out and die. Um, again, a phenomenon known as winter sun scald damage to the tree and whitewashing the plant would protect that structure throughout the winter, basically offering the plant some insulation and also by reflecting that excess light off the, you know, off the plant during those winter warm days, the plant will remain cooler, retain moisture better, and then, you know, perform significantly better come spring. So Ivory Organic basically created an entire brand. We've got now close to a dozen different products and we're continuously introducing more and more innovative um, our brand is pretty much encompassing the concept of being innovative, organic, effective, and USA made based. We're here in Los Angeles again, and our whitewash formula was pretty much piggybacked off of the traditional ancient, you can go back into Egyptian times of where you may have seen trees painted white. Like you may be driving on the five freeway heading up in Northern California, and you'll see tree trunks painted white. I know a lot of people that travel into Mexico see a lot of trees and even palm trees painted white. And it's like, what's the reason that they're painted white? And the number one reason for painting your tree trunks is to basically curb weather extremes. So we talked about winter sun scald. The other one is summer sunburn. And most of the professional orchard growers around the country, and even Tom Spellman, Dave Wilson Nursery will say that the day you plant a tree is the day you whitewash your trees. And Ivory Organics basically has taken this ancient concept of whitewashing using either limestone and, and clay, which are a couple of the ingredients in our product, but we've added milk proteins and other bond, you know, bonding agents, which are all organic that last just about as long as paint, but it doesn't contaminate your organic garden soil. So for organic orchards across America and around the world, in addition to backyard growers that want to do things right and not have to reapply paint into their garden that's designed to last 100 years or more. And you know, ultimately you're contaminating your soil with the application of paint from year to year. Ivory Organics offers an organic way. And again, for our win winner, and we've got an answer for that winter person. And before I forget, and before you guys forget, um, John, if you can share with me, who is the winner of the person that said winter? If I can just have a first and last name so I can make sure I get the address towards the end. Patrick Schilling. Thank you. Oh, 
So continuing. So Ivory Organics basically is Armory certified for organic gardening. This is basically stands for Organic Material Review Institute. It basically allows organic orchards across America to immediately buy it and apply it to their orchard, you know, trees. And so again, one of the best times for applying the product is immediately when you, they say plant it. But the other idea too is as soon as you pick up that tree from the nursery, it's been sheltered and protected by all of those other nursery trees. When you pull it out into your own garden, it's now standing alone. That tree trunk's now exposed to, here we are now, first day of summer was yesterday, 14 hours of daylight. The hottest temperatures are yet to come. And the goal is to basically protect that tree trunk, the lower branches, as we like defining it, it's the heart of the tree. And as long as you protect the heart of the tree, if the extremities burn or there's any damage, you know, further out, you can always prune that. But as long as the heart's protected and there isn't, again, trees, just like people can experience first, second and third degree burns. As long as that doesn't happen to the heart, no problem. If it happens to the extreme, you can always cut it and they'll rebound very quickly as long as the core of the tree is protected. And that's something you can do with the Ivory Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard product. Um, going now into further detail and sharing a little bit of my background, what Ivory Organics has done, and I wish I had this can open for you, and I don't see one around me that I, uh, anyways, I'm just gonna share this with you. But in here, when you open, get the can, it's basically dry. The contents are dry, it's in, a, um, it's in a baggie. And then next to it, there's an oil vial, which contains seven natural oils, which include and they're on the back here, but I'll just read it because I've got it memorized. Castor, cinnamon, clove, um, garlic, peppermint, spearmint, and rosemary. So it's got seven natural oils, which are natural insect and rodent repellent oils. And what happens when you integrate the space powder with the oils, and then you can fill up the can with water, you can actually fill up the can or use the can contents into a five gallon container. And now you can actually spray the entire tree. So you can do the foliage and the stems and everything else as long as you do it dilute. So this little can, which um, so far first winter Patrick got, um, you can basically make up to five, five gallons of foliar spray or that comes out to about 25 of these spray bottles, which we sell a lot of as well. Um, and the spray bottles, again, are a total plant protection, which includes um, among the base ingredients and the um, cinnamon and castor and clove. It also includes diatomaceous earth in both of these products too, which a lot of you guys are familiar with the anti-insect um, repellent properties of diatomaceous earth. So that too is in these products, which offers just that much more defense when you basically apply it to your trees. Tying in the background now, um, for those of you that are with me since the intro, I explained to you about that one research project that I worked at encapsulated, or, um, encapsulated antibiotics with fats. Similarly, this product basically uses those base ingredients to encapsulate the oils. When you brush it onto your tree trunk, you know, you can do, you know, one or two coats. You're basically offering, um, you know, several months up to a year of protection with these oils that are slow release compared to if it was just the oils without the encapsulated effect. They basically last a lot longer offering your plants significantly more protection than if it wasn't for. And so that's kind of the science behind the product, which comes from my early research from about 20 years ago, shockingly. Um, so you know, I just want to share with you that the pre-med and the law all came together with the Ivory Organics brand products. Just a little secret that I usually don't share with too many people, but I just want you to know that Ivory Organic also has an oil-free option. If you're not dealing with pests, then you're just dealing with the um, gardening concept known as whitewash. And just to let you know, and I expect that most of you um, aren't that familiar with whitewashing or painting your trees um, as I teach these lessons in garden centers with people that have over 10 and 20 years of experience, and they're like, I've never seen a painted tree before. And, and again, I know a lot of people of you, you know, in the class have not had, you know, that much experience in seeing painted trees, or maybe you go to the nursery and you might see a little bit of paint here and there on the plants, particularly with the avocados. Um, but it's not a very well understood, well practiced, you know, but it is as you continuously add to your arsenal of tools to become a master gardener, whitewashing is as important as fertilizing and mulching and watering and doing everything else right on your trees as it's, you know, it's offering that protection again from summer sunburn in the summer and the winter, even though, again, it's not a San Diego issue, winter sun is called, but you're also protecting um, your pruned, you know, branches. One of the things, again, a lot of research will say is not to put paint, not to put tar on those pruned surfaces, or if you see any damage on your tree as the, both of those things, latex, paint, and tar-based tar products basically trap moisture and will contribute to underlying rot. 
The cool thing about Ivory Organics is that it dries on porous, allowing the exchange of both air and nutrients to pass. So even as a foliar spray on the total plant, you can continue foliar feeding as well. Um, so there's, those are just some um, helpful tips in regards to whitewashing and hopefully it um, answers that. Let me just take a quick look at the chat. Um, can we apply it with a brush? So when you take a look at the backside of the can on whether it's the yellow, which is with oil, which is what I'm giving away today, or the blue one, which is without oil, which if you want without oil, just don't use the oil in here. Um, but on the backside and the fine print, there's three ways of using the product. And one of them is as a foliar spray, it gives you directions on how to even make an individual bottle. Um, there is directions on how to basically make the, um, the can, if you wanna basically use an entire can and apply it to, it says it covers about a dozen three gallon sized fruit trees. Again, depending on how smooth, like citrus, you should be able to get to like 20 trees if they're younger, about three gallon size or so. Um, and then compared to, for example, an oak tree that has, or you know, if it's a lot coarser um, bark, it's gonna require a lot more product. So um, brush on, maybe it would be better to, you know, as long as you filter it, you can still get a pretty good consistency and apply it with a spray. Should be able to stretch it out more. Um, and again, some people even dilute it to the point that they can make two cans out of it, but obviously it's going to be a thinner protection. Um, but you'll learn how to use it better and better um, with each application. And the third application is just adding a lot less water, like a half a can. You can use it as a tree paste. Um, one of the things it leads me to is a question I had from John Rogers a few days ago in regards to can it be used for grafting? And the answer is yes, um, but not I typically when grafting and, and a lot of the lessons I've taught in Ivory Organics with grafting and one of them that's one of the most viewed is this fig tree in my backyard that I've grafted with 10 flavors of figs, which um, include the black mission and the brown turkey, as well as I've got the striped um, tiger panache fig and um, I'm trying to think strawberry vert, the um, raspberry latte, uh, Chicago hardy. Isha, green Isha, anyways, there's 10 of them. Um, a lot of these are yellow, um, yellow long neck. Um, for those of you that know Edgar Valdivia, Paul Talley, one of his neighbors up in Simi Valley. Every single year, this has now been five years. We're going on year number six come February. We always give away free fake cuttings. So for those of you, again, on social media, be on the lookout for that. February 1st of every year, year we give away free fake cuttings. Um, but going back to the fig tree, once you successfully graft the two, and, you know, and then you take the graft apart about six to eight weeks later, then you would apply the ivory organics to basically now keep it disease and pest free. Um, and you would take off, you know, any of the protection or by that time, if you're just using parafilm, it starts breaking apart. You can add the ivory organics around, you know, that wound and as it breaks apart and continuously protect it that way. Um, again, the goal is to keep light, excess heat, and obviously keeping disease and pest from entering those, you know, you know, th those wounded um, areas. I'm trying to see here. So paint consistency, is it effective against ants? So in regards to the answer is yes, um, but can, one of the other questions is relating to ants is can ants walk on the product? And the answer is yes too. Um, imagine the diatomaceous earth as well as the oils. The oils offer a repellent protection and the diatomaceous earth is pretty much like crushed glass for anything with an exoskeleton. So ants, um, as well as beetles and termites and so forth, um, aside from walking on it, they can carefully walk over it without much harm, but it's when they try to bore into a tree. If you've ever seen, um, you know, insects as well as ants boring and ent entering and penetrating um, maybe a wounded pruned area or damaged bark, maybe even caused by sunburn, the ivory ants will basically coat and protect those surfaces so that there's no penetration and the tree can begin to heal. Um, those coated surfaces. So just keep that in mind when it comes to, and that answers the next question from Britta in regards to effective against borers. And the answer is yes. Um, continuing on with whitewashing, we've addressed um, winter sun scald. So another tip I want to relate under this topic is um, foliar spray. Some we talked about summer pruning. So summer was yesterday. Today's the 22nd. And um, one of the I'm going to just ask this question. I'm going to leave it to the, I mean, the, the room can answer as well. And I'm not giving a gift away for this question, but most important time of the year for pruning. When is it? Any guesses you guys can write in the chat room or, um, or the class can participate and I can catch my breath for mm -hmm. a second or two. Fall. Fall. 
So I hear a lot of fall. For uh, There's actually a better month or a better season, I should say. Yeah, I see it now. Um, so, so Don, Don already got it. So Don um, Dickinson says winter and summer, and I love that answer because it's both. And fall is not the right answer. The goal is to wait. And again, San Diego is a unique um, grow zone. But the goal is to wait for what is your last chance of frost in your area. And I'm sure if you go to a map and, and basically plug this in with your grow zone, they'll tell you your last chance of frost is. Here in LA, I told you the coldest in my particular grow zone that it ever gets in winter is like 45 degrees. Last chance of frost, I do have a date, is that last week of January. So the ideal time for me to begin pruning my plants, and this is the number one time of the year to be pruning those branches that are older than two years of age. So those thicker, bigger, major pruning that you should be doing in your plant is going to be late winter is the general answer. But more specifically, late winter for us would be like we're talking about in March is too late. For me here again in Los Angeles, it's that last week of January, first two weeks of February. For you, it might be like the middle of January, late January is what I'm guessing would be the ideal time. And the reason to get the timing right is you're trying to beat when your, trans, your plants are going to be pushing out the most blooms and also beginning to shoot, you know, so like there should still be predominantly dormant. And what the plants rely on, aside from your cooler temperatures in the winter, is the fact that your light hours are shorter. So the plants are aware of what's going on. And you're going to do the most hacking, the most damage, the most shaping to your tree in that period of time. Again, late winter is the general answer for the country. But for us, it's really the, the more specific time is after the last chance of frost has passed, then you do it. Um, again, to give you guys the answer, I would say mid-January to late January. For me, it's that last week of January, first week or two of February is the ideal time um, for major pruning. But summertime, right now, as you're harvesting your fruits off of your peaches, plums, apricots, cherries, your guavas, your mangoes, your avocados, whatever trees are you harvesting is an excellent time to also be pruning your plants. You don't want to prune your plants significantly while they're supporting the most amount of fruit. As again, those leaves are the solar panels and providing the sugars and proteins and all the, you know, energy to that plant, as well as, you know, development, root strength, and so forth. The better time for pruning your plants is going to be um, after fruit harvest. And I know for some of you, you know, for example, I've got a Granny Smith in my backyard, and those fruit usually ripen by October, November, and that's late, you know, and it's not going to push out significant growth towards the end of the year. But for those plants that you can prune and shape Again, using only that growth that happened this year to last year. So you're looking at first and second year growth. So this is more shaping and controlling and managing the height. It's important for those of you that practice another gardening concept known as the backyard orchard culture, where you want to make sure that those fruit, for example, on your um, dormant fruit trees, again, that includes your peaches, plums, apricots, apples, and so forth, is that you wanna make sure that the plants end up going into dormancy and that those branches are still within reach. As long as you can reach those highest branches by the end of the year, by next year come bloom, those blooms are also gonna be within reach, which means the fruit are gonna be within reach too. So this is an awesome time for visiting your garden and kind of seeing are some of those branches just so far out of the way and getting so vigorous. And again, the more that those branches grow away from you, if Again, your goal is not to have gigantic trees. And I know for me in my backyard, you know, I'm in a standard size lot and I've got minimal garden space, but in my backyard, I've got 25 fruit trees because I've got my trees spaced about seven to eight feet apart. Um, some of them were multi-grafted so I can, you know, you know, reap the benefits of having more flavors on one tree. But my trees are close together, which requires that you've got to keep your trees in check height-wise as well. If you let them grow too big, there's, 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 they're, just, huh. they're basically just going to drown out and shade all the neighboring plants and your fruit yields and your um, success from year to year is going to be diminished. So um, an important consideration is keeping your, um, you know, your plants in check. And summertime is the second most important time of the year to just make sure that's happening. Um, I just did a lesson this week on um, summer pruning that'll be published hopefully within the next week. So you can be on the lookout for that and some more helpful tips 
relating to summer pruning. So um, keep that in mind when you visit your garden next. Um, and, and that's it for that topic. Um, any questions relating to whitewashing before we get into fertilizer? I think I see a hand. Um, is that Pat Holland? Hi, um, slightly related to what you said. What do you do for the Argentinian ants that nest in the soil? You destroy the roots uh, and farm aphids on your plants and they're being grown in clay pots. So for the aphids, again, the can can make this product. This product is basically spraying onto your plant, diatomaceous earth, as well as cinnamon and, and, and garlic. And all of these things are naturally aphid repellent um, ingredients. Ants, you can the spray ants. the plant. It'll keep the aphids under control. The Argentinian ants in the soil, if they're at the soil level, an awesome practice to consider using is um, basically a neem oil drench. You can get your hands on like, you know, organic neem oil. Um, and you can make a solution with water. It's usually like about a teaspoon or I mean a tablespoon to a gallon, maybe two. And you're basically dumping that solution in the soil. Um, and that pretty much helps keep ants at bay. And if you can control, obviously, the ant population, it also helps keep the aphid population in check as well. Nothing else because I'm allergic to, to neem. Yeah. So um, aside from from that, I'm thinking another organic, um, but I, I'm not so sure because I know if there's a few pests that are not effective with this particular product is using, um, um, I have it on the tip of my tongue, is a bacteria known as spinosad. And there's a lot of spinosad based products. It's basically a bacteria that you can, a solution you would um, apply to the soil. Um, and I know that helps control a lot of other pests. Um, but that aside, and another, a third one that comes up as well is just putting ant traps as well. And that's something that doesn't even need to touch the soil. Done it's that. Just it a didn't thought. Work. Done that. Didn't work. I'm losing yeah. Achillea sinensis. Oh, that's. And it, they're damaging a, a potted uh, citrus that was very healthy. Um, uh, uh, here's another, another thought too, is, is just getting a hands on just diatomaceous earth, maybe just concentrate and just applying it to the soil. And just having that much more, you can imagine like crushed glass, even though keep in mind, diatomaceous earth is safe on people, pets, and even your earthworms. It really affects only things with exoskeletons. And if it gets into their joints, it basically um, scratches them and dries them out. So those are um, just, that's a, that's a third helpful tip for hopefully controlling the ants for you. And it works watering the soil. It'll still work. Yeah. yeah. Yes. A, a friend said that in Texas said that they use, uh, and I don't understand this, um, dried um, molasses. Have you ever heard of that? Um, it sounds as if the sugar would attract more ants, but hey, I hey. don't know. Maybe it's not organic molasses and that's yeah, yeah. why it works. Thank you. You're very welcome. So we're now going to go off to our topic number two, even though we've talked about a lot more than two things, but our next lesson is going to be on fertilizer. And this I'm opening to the classroom as well as the Zoom meeting is, um, and I wanna make sure I phrase this question. That's why I'm looking at this one here. What is the most important, and I'm qualifying it with heaviest application month of the year. So you're gonna give me a month of the year to fertilize your trees. What is the most important, heaviest application month of the year to fertilize your trees? Classroom first. Well, not sure who, who's the first. Before food step. No, who's, who's the first? <laughs> who's the first person? So John, what, what answers do you have? Uh, we, got, uh, we got February, we got March. October, April. Oh, you're, you're, you're getting a month. <laughs> okay, so keep going. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for another month. May. Okay, so someone in the classroom said May? Yeah. Okay, when, who when was that? Is, oh, go ahead. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. What's the name so I can write it down? Yep. 
Did you say Poe? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll make sure I, I get the um, the address after the meeting. <laughs> and the answer is May. And I also said a second month. And I love the fact again, and I hope you guys are enjoying this too. I'm throwing out these questions. Um, and it kind of helps me test all of you too. I don't know if you realize this, that uh, I'm making sure that we're all leaving learning more from this meeting. And, and I'm so glad to be a part of your growing success for this year for the majority in this group. Um, and the answer is May. And the answer is May and or June. And it really depends on if you're hopefully feeding your plants organically. If you're feeding your plants organically, the best month of the year for feeding your plants is May. And the reason is you're giving the soil biology a chance to break down those organic elements that are in those organic fertilizers, bringing those elements into the soil to then benefit the entire plant structure. So, and that's usually by June. The reason June is the number one month. And again, I actually have this chart prepared so you guys can see this as well. So this here is kind of the um, seasons here on the bottom with winter, spring, summer, fall and winter. I got summer is the season that you need to feed your plants the most. Whatever the application is on the back of the fertilizer, you're gonna to wanna to apply as much as it recommends for the plant, especially in summer. Come spring, even though some of you said, you know, spring is the most important time to feed your plants. Yes, you should start warming up, feeding your plants some coming out of winter, but it's, you know, it's about half as much as you would otherwise apply come summer Fall, again, low dose amount of fertilizer. In winter, it's also important to consider foliar feeding your plants to make sure that they have all of the nutrients necessary for optimal blooms and ultimately fruit set come spring. So you're pretty much always making sure that all the nutrients are in the soil, which we're gonna to get to momentarily. But the most important time for feeding your plants is summer. So let's say yesterday, because again, Light hours are peaking. We're dealing with 14 hours of daylight. Plant metabolism is peaking, kind of like that chart that we just saw. And so to make sure that the plants have all of the elements necessary for optimal growth, performance, disease resistance, and so forth, drought tolerance, is to make sure that the plants have all of those nutrients in the soil. And by applying your fertilizer in May, especially your organic ones, they'll be broken down in time for that peak light hour come June. The reason I say organic versus synthetic, the synthetic fertilizers are supposed to be readily available um, and you can apply them in June and they'll be there in June. But for those of you that have not yet fed your plants, even for the organic application, do so like soon um, and, and make sure you, you feed your plants. So um, now you guys have the answer for that. Um, and another helpful tip when it relates to fertilizers as well, and also Southern California going into a drought and we're cutting back on water, the element phosphorus, which is known for aiding plants in flowering and fruiting is also an aid to plants drought resistance. So plants can perform a lot better with phosphorus available in the soil. Um, and the watering practice in general is to just make sure that your plants again, on this restricted watering pattern, make sure that when you water, you soak your plants. And the goal is to, you know, allow the soil to dry, but it should also never go bone dry because that's another stress to the plant. So if you're going, you know, whether you're using a water meter or you're checking a couple of inches below the soil, if you see that it's bone dry, that's another stress to the plant. The goal is to always, always make sure that there is water um, available to the plant. And, and again, the general test is just to avoid that bone dryness, but you do want to make sure that it's not continuously wet either. Um, so again, I know this is the third or fourth time I've said this, is just to make sure that soil is never bone dry. Um, the emphasis on that. So I agree organic with that being said. Um, the third giveaway that we're doing, and this may be, anyways, I'm just gonna leave it at that. The third giveaway we're doing right now is that Ivory Organics, and hopefully some of you have seen this, has a couple of products. And when I approach our distributorship about us doing fertilizer, they're like, there's a thousand companies out there doing fertilizer. What are you going to do that's different? And, um, and Ivory Organics came up with these two products that we saw that there was a hole in the marketplace with feeding plants. And so Ivory Organics came up with this um, premium blend and a super blend fertilizer um, because almost like at least 95, 98% you know, of brands out there are only offering 
limited amount of nutrients to plants. And so that leads me to my next giveaway question, which is um, how many plant macronutrients are there? And classroom first. And for those of you that are in the Zoom meeting, feel free to put in your answers now. But again, the question is how many plant macronutrients are there? Meaning the nutrients that plants need in abundance, they should be readily available in the soil for them to do well. I see the chat room writing some stuff. Um, I'm asking now the classroom, is there an answer out there? We got three and we got nine so far. Okay, so I'm closing it to the classroom because I saw an answer now that's right. Um, the answer, so again, I gave the classroom the first chance and they, those two answers were wrong. Um, the answer is six. So Don Dickinson is our winner number three. And the three macronutrients everybody should know is NPK, which stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And so you got your nitrogen, which is going to help, you know, create a nice growing, strong, healthy plant. Phosphorus, as we just mentioned, for drought tolerance, but also flowers and fruit. And then your potassium for root structure and disease resistance. So you've got your NPK, but if you Google this, and this was kind of shocking to me, that you basically do a little bit of research out there, it'll come right up on the top of your page. You know, what are the macronutrients plants need? And the answer is six, not three. Plants also need in abundance in the soil. Um, I would love to ask you guys if we were all in person, but I'm just gonna say it. Um, magnesium is one of those elements that the plants need in abundance. And the magnesium molecule is the heart of the chlorophyll molecule. Um, so the magnesium element is the heart of the chlorophyll molecule. You got magnesium. The other one is sulfur, which is very important in the plant's metabolic processes. And as well as you'll see sulfur, um, usually in greening products, like things that you wanna you know, turn a lawn green quick. There'll always be nitrogen. There'll always be sulfur too. And then the other one is calcium. And calcium is basically in the cell walls of all plants. So you can imagine as your plants are growing, they're pushing out and, you know, taking in a lot of calcium. It's actually, I think the third most important and most abundant element within a plant structure is calcium. And all of that's coming from the soil. So if the soil is lacking in calcium, how can it possibly perform as well? So um, all of these products that Ivory Organic makes um, basically have um, the six macronutrients, which include the NPK, magnesium, sulfur, and calcium, as well as we've also partnered up with azomite. If I can get this a little closer here, um, it's the Super Blend Plus azomite. Azomite is simply a volcanic crushed rock. And so it helps give your plants a lot of the micronutrients as well. And there's people that just buy azomite alone just to get those micronutrients into the soil. Um, and it's an excellent you know, product as well. But our Ivory Organic brand fertilizers have all this, six macronutrients plus the micronutrients as well. Um, and as I said at the beginning, for those of you that are going to be at the Walter Anderson Nursery on Saturday, the one on Enterprise, and again, I'll put the address down there in just a minute, um, they're going to have all the products there and it'll be conveniently located near you or obviously, as always, you can shop online. And I gave you a promo code near the beginning as well. So um, we've got that. And, um, and just to share a little bit more about the Ivory Organic brand products. I mean, as you can see, I mean, the products are innovative. There's still more SKUs. You can see a little bit and learn a little bit more about us at ivoryorganics.com. Um, our products are innovative, organic, effective, and USA made, as we said at the beginning. Um, and I encourage all of you guys to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you know anybody that would like additional help or tips um, or advice, whether there's a garden class near you, you need some help. All of our lessons are free. I've noticed, um, aside from maybe one or two of you, um, that there's a lot of, and, and I feel like it's part of the reason we've been so successful on social media, is that we bring something new um, to the gardening community that's very important for gardening success. One being the whitewashing, two being our fertilizers and, and just the applications and the way to use them. Um, and we just love teaching and we don't charge for it. We, we want, you know, everybody to learn. We want everybody to su succeed. Um, and anything we can do to be a part of your gardening success, you know, please let us know and introduce us to your favorite nurseries, your favorite garden clubs and so forth. And we're so proud to be also a member of the California Rare Fruit Growers 
here in Los Angeles, as well as Orange County. And looking forward to hopefully meeting all of you guys in person whenever I'm down in San Diego next, which the soonest is going to be this Saturday at the Walter Anderson Nursery. Um, are there any other questions I can maybe help answer? And maybe it'll steer me down a path where I can talk for another five or 10 minutes. Can we just use diatomaceous earth or kidney litter basically to uh, spread around the root zone of the plants to help subdue ions? Diatomaceous earth, kidney litter is diatomaceous earth. Yeah. So diatomaceous earth is used in a lot of ways. You can sprinkle it around the base of the tree. Um, other things, you know, or other ways people use it is just putting it around the whole perimeter of their property. Wherever there's an issue, um, you can simply draw borders with diatomaceous earth and you should see some movement. And at the end of the day, these are all repellent protections. You're simply moving them from one direction to another. Um, or again, hopefully suppressing and keeping their populations at bay. Um, but again, these are all like repellent tactics. It's not poison. You're not killing them. Um, really, aside from just like smothering their population. Oh, I'm reading a comment online here. It says in regards to where you can see the videos. Um, again, the brand is <laughs> Hive Organics. And I know it's in the chat room up above. You can just put it on Google or in YouTube. If you just search for IV, it actually, most people see it as Roman numeral four. So for organic um, between us and this chapter, IV is named after my two little girls, Isabel and Victoria. Um, and and that's, that's our brand and hopefully something that many generations will get to enjoy as well. Um, how are your fertilizer tea bags different than the bag fertilizer? And the answer, I'm, I'm, so again, Dawn knows our products. That's why she's getting these answers correct. Um, the, the, the tea, there's also an Ivory Organics um, tea box um, product, which basically puts about a tablespoon, um, I think and a half in a tea bag that you can then soak for an hour up to 24 hours and basically create a solution that you'll then use to foliar feed your plants. And you know how we had this chart, fertilizing should, especially on your evergreen plants, like your bananas, your um, avocados, your mangoes, your... Um, again, all of those plants are evergreen and fruiting, um, you're still going to want to make sure that you're fertilizing them in the winter by making sure that they have all of the macronutrients. And these Ivory Organic brand products have it all. By simply soaking it, the goal with the tea bags is it's um, basically keeping the solution clean and clear of debris. So when you add it to your sprayer, it's not going to damage the spray. And um, you can take these products and put it like in an old sock or basically like find a way to like filter the, um, the product so that you can create the solution and then use the solution as a foliar feed is um, just to let you know a little bit more of an economical way to um, create an unlimited amount of liquid fertilizer. And kind of, as it says here, another way too is um, it's like this four pound bag makes 120 gallons. There's a smaller bag as well that makes 20 gallons a product that's going to be at Walter Anderson this weekend. Um, the, the smaller bag, so 20 gallons, it's basically a tablespoon to a gallon of water and you can make your own uh, like liquid fertilizer, liquid feed, or even foliar feed that way. Um, so thanks for asking that question. Any other questions? Here, um, last minute. Oops, I forgot. I think we're all good, but oh. I appreciate you coming out at such short notice and giving us all this great information. Yeah, yeah. very, <laughs> very <laughs> welcome. What's his name? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, do you need any more information from us to get those uh gifts away to um Poe and Patrick? Yeah, so. Yeah. so I was hoping that John Rogers would email me the names okay. and addresses, or at least email addresses, and I will be more than happy to get those out this week. Okay, that sounds awesome. So I'm just going to add a few more comments to the in the comment section, and I'll sign out unless there's any other questions for me. You know, the boiler, boiler spray for avocados trying to protect it from the heat, because we had that 115 degree heat. And how can you see white 
or some little leaves that's going to protect it, you know, from the heat? Or how does that work? Um, so, so I don't know why it's echoing so badly. Is this better now? Uh, a little yeah. bit. Okay, I think we got under control. Um, so in regards to using the, the foliar spray, so the goal when whitewashing, as you can imagine, so the can basically works as a brush on. So obviously that's offering a thicker protection. When you're using it as a foliar spray, and keep in mind, this is about, this can makes about 20 to 25 like spray bottles. It's diluted that far, but I've seen both commercial growers and even backyard growers. Um, and there's one that's coming up with, I don't know if you're familiar, his name is um, Gerardo Tejeda. He's based um, here in um, central Orange County and he grows like a hundred different varieties of avocados in his backyard. And he puts on an application that's almost as thick as the brush on solution. So um, it's almost like a watery paint. And he basically sprays the entire plant structure on his like two to three year old avocado trees that are about two to three feet tall. He sprays them white, completely white. Um, and he's like, this helps them get through summer. And, and you can imagine, I mean, turning your plants white that are otherwise green is definitely going to mess up with photosynthesis, but that, that one-time protection over the plant is going to keep the plant from burning. It's still going to go through a hot, it's basically going through the oven at 115 degrees, but it's going to have some protection on it rather than just getting cooked. Um, so the spray basically offers its dilute, it kind of goes on the spray bottle, or if you make your own um, product using the can, it basically goes on about the consistency of like milk um, when you spray it on your plant. So by the time it dries off, it kind of, you know, appears that it's not there. It helps your plants also as an anti-transplant transplant shock and so forth. Um, but the goal is you're offering it some protection and especially on your larger trees, it's going to be um, probably a little harder to get that much protection. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend turning your entire large avocado trees white, um, but the whitewash will help suppress and reduce the, the, the brunt of the damage that would otherwise happen. And even if, and I've seen this scenario as well, it goes through the, the 115 degrees and drops all of its leaves. The, the basically the tree trunk and those lower branches that still have good sufficient product on there are gonna be pushing out leaves and shoots like within a matter of days compared to if it took on that heat directly. Um, and that's another thing to consider in regards to the value of what whitewash can do for your trees. Cool. So then that, that uh, whitewashing with the thinner mix, then that doesn't impair the transpiration of the uh, plant. I have a general question and I don't have the answer, but um, as environmentalists, you know, growing organically, plastics hurt the soil, they hurt the ocean, they hurt us. Is there a way for you to package your product without plastics? Everyone's doing it, unfortunately, with plastics. Yeah, um, we've worked with um, a lady named Lee Gad. She's um, a she's the wife of Toby Gad, singer songwriter that lives a few blocks away from us and invited us to an Earth Day event here in Los Angeles about four to five years ago. And if you go to Ivory Organics YouTube channel and you put in um, Ivory Organics on YouTube with Lee Gad, L-I, and then G-A-D, um, this lesson should come up where she kind of inspired us to do something where we have a zero waste program, where we basically ship the products as just the contents and, a, um, and then just a label description on how to use the products, but there's no can and, and basically we're trying to reduce the, um, just the need for all of this when all you need is the inside and you can sim simply use a Starbucks cup. That's another piece of plastic, um, but maybe a coffee mug, something in your garage that you can simply use your pint size can and still mix and create the solution without using all of this extra, you know, steps and parts and, and, and labor. And those are products that are a zero waste program, which you'll find at ivoryorganics.com are about 30% cheaper than the other products. And we're continuously looking at ways to do, you know, refill programs and so forth. Um, oh, and, and, and always looking at ways to, to be more effective and, and more impactful. And the other thing too, is we, we recycle as much as we can. A lot of the boxes and packing materials and everything that we get go 
like nothing gets almost nothing really gets thrown away even the boxes some of the boxes that you know basically contain cans of about 50 to 60 cans at a time when they go to nurseries or drop off or they're going right back on shelves they give they we usually pick it right back up all the deliver, deliveries and shipments we use the same boxes year after year um like indefinitely even though we go through thousands of boxes we try to reuse and, and keep them within the program we're talking about paper products that don't get thrown away thank you i'm glad in addition to plastics in that direction but yeah, you'd yeah. have to get places like walter anderson and other nurseries to do that for sure because if, if we bought from you we'd have to pay shipping somehow wouldn't we so this is the walter anderson that's right there off the pacific highway yeah in san diego yes yeah. So another question that came in from Cheryl is, is fertilizing on the same as application of chicken or rabbit manure? Um, and some of these, it's, it's a good practice, obviously, to use rabbit manure and chicken manure, um, which are predominantly higher in nitrogen again. But the goal is um, to, and I've got to double check, you know, in regards to the balance of, again, now you all know that plants need six macronutrients. And check to see does rabbit manure include magnesium and calcium and sulfur and all these other elements. Otherwise, you're really just giving your plants one of the same. Um, and another good practice, in addition to if you're already doing chicken and rabbit manure, is hopefully you've also got a composting program going on your property as well. We're incorporating a lot of the you know, nutrition that you're eating. Some of that waste is also going to give a lot more elements um, to your plants. Another lesson I did many years ago is just the use of like fish fertilizers or even like fish products on your garden and how a fish has about 80 elements in them. And it's like, and one of the great questions I got from that is why would you need 80 elements in the garden? And I'd love to ask you guys the question, but I'm just going to answer it is um, the 80 elements are basically feeding your soil biology. When you're doing things organically, you're feeding the earthworms, the beneficial bacteria, the mycorrhiza, and that whole network of life that's below the soil. And when you're actually taking care of it, you're basically gonna have a longer, healthier, better productive, um, happier tree than if you're doing things synthetically. If you're using those chemical fertilizers, you're actually harming the soil biology and your plants become more reliant and, and on you offering those NPK and other macronutrients and micronutrients to your plants because you've just wrecked that whole soil biology below one, by not feeding it, and two, by possibly adding too much salt, um, which is a side effect of using those synthetic fertilizers. So um, doing things organically is just going to create a healthier environment for those plants. Cool. If there's no more questions, um, thank you, Charles. Of course. And, and have a great week. Thanks for having me, guys, and hoping to see you guys on Saturday morning. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you.